Ladies and gentlemen, my name is uh, Michael Swetnam, and I'm the CEO of the Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. We're a not-for-profit academic institution in the Washington, D.C. area that concentrates on the issues of science and technology and how science and technology can inform good policy. We have been for uh, almost 15 years uh, the host of the International Center for Terrorism Studies uh, that is directed by Professor Yona Alexander and has been responsible for over a hundred academic works on all aspects of, of terrorism and its effects on our society. We're very privileged and happy to have hosted this organization and over that uh, 15 years to have uh, hosted and sponsored literally thousands of seminars like this one and it's uh, it's been possible uh, not just because of the great work of Professor Alexander, but because we have often, for most of that time, and through all, all of those seminars, I think, had the, uh, the friendship, support, and uh, partnership of the International Law Institute. So I'm very happy to recognize the chairman of that organization, uh, Professor Don Wallace, who will clo give his closing remarks today. It is by bringing together academic and non-governmental organizations around the world to address these issues that were able to, I think, put some of the best minds that the human race has on these problems and hopefully bring uh, some scholarship to, to developing solutions and options for dealing with horrible things like terrorism. I'd make a few comments before I turn it over to Professor Alexander to introduce uh, our speakers today, and I think you'll agree. We put together uh, probably one of the most distinguished panels uh, that the Institute has ever had to address these issues. We're at, a, I think, a turning point uh, in addressing terrorism globally, and therein the title of today's uh, seminar, The Next Phase. What is the next step? Uh, several people have written over the last year about the phases of addressing terrorism that we've gone through over the last couple decades. You could consider the post-9-11 time uh, uh, what I would call the local law enforcement irritant phase, where terrorism, of course, was very active as a tool around the world. Many countries suffered acts of terrorism within their border. 
There was, in fact, many instances of international terror, but an awful lot of the world treated the scourge of terrorism as something that was the problem of the local law enforcement officials. And to the extent that there was global co cooperation, it was one country helping another that was fighting a battle against some type of terrorism. Then, of course, 9-11. And during 9-11, we saw the the tremendous reaction of the United States, which included efforts to build international coalitions to address this, not the scourge of terrorism, not just as a phenomenon that was happening from 9-11 on, but as a phenomenon that had been happening in uh, human society for many generations. And it was kind of accepted around the world that to properly address the problems of terrorism, we needed to do this as a world community. And if there was any great success since 9-11, I think it clearly is that most of the world's governments have bonded together to address this threat in a very collective way. And the success that we've seen, to the extent that we've seen good success, and I think we have in many ways, it's due to a large extent due to that cooperation. We're kind of at a turning point right now. A lot of people are talking about the problems of terrorism once again as local law enforcement problems that are an irritant to local governments, but not necessarily the concern of others around the world. Whether that is a proper way to view the future or not, I think is a key point to be addressed at this conference, uh, this seminar here today. And that's why we have at the table individuals who have been involved in that international cooperation. And of course, many in the room who have been involved in that as well, who are good ambassador, former ambassador from Spain sitting in the front row as well who have dealt with this, this use of cooperation to handle all of our problems of terrorism in a way that has been very, very successful. I would contend that if there's any lesson for the future that we've learned over the last 12 years, it's that working together is far, far more effective than trying to address these issues singularly. And it's a lot more than just friendship. It's important that we realize an attack in Kenya is just as important as an attack in New York City. And we should uh, treat all attacks as if they're attacks on our citizens, not just on the citizens of another country. So with that introduction, I hope you'll forgive my editorial comments there. I will turn the podium over to Professor Yona Alexander, who will introduce uh, the ambassadors to speak about uh, how we should approach the next generation. Professor. Oh, I want to okay. note as well. We have a couple of latest books, our latest book on Al-Qaeda 10 years after, and we'll be uh, uh, giving these to our speakers as gifts, as well as uh, a major work by our, our, the chairman of our Board of Regents, uh, General Al Gray, the first part of his career. This is the first part of a three-volume set that we'll be publishing. Uh, we recommend these to all of you. They're available here at the Potomac Institute, and we'll be very pleased to uh, hand them out to our speakers today. Professor. Right. Thank you. I don't know if it works. I will have to, to probably check with them. You know this? Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Mike, for your uh, introduction and, uh, and, and comments. Um, I would like to join you to welcome uh, the audience. Um, obviously, uh, we do have the speakers, and we're going to introduce them uh, very shortly. Um, we have many colleagues right here at the audience, academics, and diplomats uh, who are going to try to enlighten us and provide uh, some insights into the discussion. I would like to also welcome the new intern who are going to be right here at the 
International Center on Terrorism Studies for the fall. And we want to thank them also for supporting uh, this event, organizing it, and particularly to thank uh, Marianne, I don't know if she's there, for please come in. We would like to acknowledge your coordination and your gourmet footing and food and everything else. And um, also we would like to thank uh, CISPAN for their very significant public uh, service to uh, bring the discussion here to a wider audience in the United States uh, and abroad in order to stimulate uh, debate on critical issues. Now, um, the purpose, if you look at our publicity initially, um, I would like to mention that the rationale for this meeting is uh, very simple. Uh, as the United Nations uh, General Assembly is convening for its uh, 68th session, certainly combating terrorism is one of the major agenda issues. Now, while we look at the United Nations and the New York, we have to keep in mind that international cooperation in combating terrorism is really critical. But it's not only the United Nations. We do have, fortunately, many regional and arrangements such as the League of the Arab States, the African countries, and the European Union, who are playing a critical role, not only to deal with terrorism, but with other uh, issues. So the purpose really is to enlighten, I think, the public in terms of what other organizations are doing in order to advance international cooperation. And uh, as I mentioned uh, before, I think fundamentally there are two major concerns. One, as we already discussed, terrorism. It's only one of many other challenges. Um, and then, of course, we do have the natural disasters such as the earthquake now in Pakistan. And one aspect of that, according to the reports, that terrorists try to undermine the security uh, activities there to save lives and protect lives. So in other words, we have to look at the nature, mother nature, disasters, and man-made disasters, including the terrorism, including crime, as we have seen the Navy Yard just last week, and the uh, war that is going on in uh, Syria and elsewhere. So fundamentally, I think we're going to discuss not only the terrorism issue, but other risks, threats, and challenges to the international community. Now, it is really critical, I think, in my mind, to mention that there are historical lessons. If we look, for example, at the month of September now, the anniversary dates, we can recall during the month of September, going all the way back to 1972, the Munich Olympic Games, that the entire world watched what happened in Munich. Then, for example, the 9-11 attack that Mike mentioned, and about a week ago, we tried to learn the lessons of 9-11. And then one of the more spectacular attacks took place in Baslan, in the Caucasus, when Chechen separatists, they seized the school. And the list goes on and on. And what is really important to keep in mind as far as terrorism goes, that there were extraordinary moments of crisis of nations related to terrorism. And it's going on all the time while we discuss the issue today. 
So if I may, I would like to uh, present some graphics here in terms of our discussion. Not only the Al-Qaeda, but we're going to discuss today uh, issues of the affiliates of the Al-Qaeda, particularly in the Maghreb, in uh, East Africa, in West Africa, and Central Africa. So if one can look at this particular map that we try to develop, in other words, the arch of instability uh, all the way from the Atlantic to the Red Sea, uh, you can see very clearly that almost every country has some concern with the Al-Qaeda affiliates. Uh, and we're very fortunate to have the ambassador from Mali and is going to discuss this as well. Uh, we are concerned about what's happening all the way from West Africa and Nigeria, Mali and elsewhere, Morocco, uh, that had recently some uh, major incidents, uh, and of course the situation in uh, Kenya. Now, if one can look, we try to follow the graphs and the statistics all the way with ups and downs. According to our studies, we believe, and I wish we would be wrong about that, that in the post 9-11, the year 2013 is going to be the bloodiest year yet. And we can go into some of these issues. Now, particularly what I want to mention before I introduce our distinguished panel is to mention that while the situation in Kenya and Nairobi apparently is over, the Al-Qaeda is alive and well and kicking in the past couple of days. They also attacked uh, in the region. So fundamentally what's happening the Al-Shabaab and some of the affiliates of the Al-Qaeda, they think globally, but they act initially locally and regionally. And I say globally, it really means that perhaps the Al-Qaeda and its affiliates will try to reach the United States and some of the operatives who are American citizens, for example, there is a long list might come back and strike in the United States itself. And then, of course, in addition to the sub-national groups, we have to consider uh, the role of state-sponsored terrorism, such as uh, Syria, uh, Iran, and so on. So the bottom line is this. As far as the outlook, and I would like to suggest that fundamentally we're going to see about three different trends. One, propaganda by the deed, meaning to use the guns and the bombs. Secondly, the electronic battlefield, the deed by propaganda that we have seen, for example, in Kenya and elsewhere. And thirdly, the technological terrorism, the cyber, the phone, iPhone revolution, and so on. We have to be also concerned about the role of women increasingly, such as the black widows or the white widow, apparently according to a report that she was involved or was not involved, at least in Kenya. And we have to be also concerned about the long roofs and we have to be concerned about the future generation, which really means uh, their children. Now, it gives me a great honor to invite our panel today, and I will introduce them according to their presentation. Uh, you do have the bio, so I won't go into uh, details. And Ambassador um, Al Husseini Al Sharif, who is the ambassador of the League of the Arab uh, States uh, in the United States, he assumed this post uh, last, uh, last year. He has a very distinguished, I think, career in diplomacy, uh, serving in uh, different countries like uh, Turkey and Venezuela and Mali uh, and so forth. 
uh, he received his PhD at the University of uh, Houston, um, and he lectured uh, many institutions uh, in this country uh, and abroad. It is indeed a privilege uh, to invite him uh, because we had representatives from the Arab League before who spoke at our events, and uh, I look forward to his uh, comments not only related to the issue of terrorism, but the broader security concerns of uh, the League of the Arab States. Mr. Ambassador, if you kindly could come here. Thank you. Thank you, Professor uh, Yuna. Do you hear me? I think that's... Uh, um, I would like to thank also the panel. Uh, I don't want to go over the names, um, but it's very interesting that I have a colleague here from Mali. When I was the head of the Saudi mission in Mali, he was the second or third secretary, I think. And now we meet here as ambassadors. He's, he represents Mali and I represent the League. I used to, pre to represent uh, Saudi Arabia um, for 35 years. It's not me, it's the microphone, but uh, <laughs> I, I don't need it actually. I think it's a very small room. So I, anyway, it's, uh, I will change my, a little bit my topic really. It's uh, since I, I mean, I saw, I, I noticed that you were talking about terrorism and so on, and this is, there is a, there are volumes of literature now since 9-11 since on uh, terrorism, and I was speaking on terrorism in, in Canada because in 2001 I was in Canada at that time, so as ambassador of Saudi Arabia, so my job or my, actually most of my time was devoted to this topic, I mean, so I will try to shift my topic uh, from the Arab League and the United States, but I will give you an idea about uh, our relationship the change in the policy of the United States really vis-a-vis -vis the Arab League uh, in recent years or since the um, Arab Spring, what you call Arab Spring, and then I will move to terrorism uh, for some min few minutes, which really it's a topic that it's, I am interested in, I mean, throughout my diplomatic career, I was in a position always to defend and to explain. Uh, but it's uh, now I will just to give you an idea. I represent the Arab League. It's, two, uh, it's composed of 22 countries. Started with seven countries, ended up with 22. It's uh, the Arab world is really it's a it's a uh, the population of the Arab League is 360 million. It's um, uh, it's very strategic. It's very important. It's uh, it has the greatest reserves of oil. 58% of the world reserves, oil reserves. Natural gas also is 28% of the world reserves of natural gas. It's also the cradle of three religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's also the, the, um, the, the it's, it witnessed the rise of uh, ancient civilization more than anywhere in the world, I think, the Arab world there. You have Egypt, you have Iraq, you have Jordan, those, they have civilizations that really you need months in order to see all of these um, uh, sites. Of, uh, um, all of these assets that the Arab world enjoy there, or the Middle East is in general, but anyway the Arab world region, made it a place really of conflicts and uh, tangled interests, and gave the Arab world demographic, economic, religious, and strategic weight. Uh, now I will move to the uh, Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, uh, uh, now it's really nobody calls it the Arab Spring anymore. Not even the Arab Awakening. Many they suggest, or one writer, I think one journalist suggested, maybe correctly, that we should call it the Arab Decade, or the Arab Quarter Century, because it takes, it will take many years really. You haven't seen promising results so far in those countries, and this might delay also the revolt or the tension or the violence or in other country, Arab countries after what we have seen, but I'm sure that things will go, will change into the better in the long or short run because it needs time. Uh, 
the United States, perhaps, perhaps it was taken by surprise by the changes in those five countries, Tunisia, uh, Egypt, uh, Libya, uh, Yemen, and uh, Syria now still going on. Uh, of course, the, uh, the Arab Spring came as a result of the demands of the people of, for justice, for uh, equality, for democracy, for uh, combating, uh, combating uh, uh, corruption. Um, um, and these demands and these are the values, of course, that they have been. Of course, the, the, there are some driving, um, some driving factors in the, in the Arab Spring. Uh, of course, technology played a, played a major role on social media in, the, in these revolts in those countries. Uh, the military also played a role, major role in, uh, in Tunisia and Egypt, not by, I mean, taking the sides of the regime, but by being neutral, it played a role, really. It left it to the people to revolt and lead the revolution. Uh, also, the... Um, there was some intervention of outside powers, um, NATO and Libya, and maybe Turkey, Syria, and Iran and Russia and Syria. Uh, Turkey and Russia and Syria, and Iran and Russia also in Syria. Also, the longevity of, uh, of the leadership being in power from 20 to 40 years in those countries also, this will explain why the people revolted. Uh, there are, of course, other grievances. I don't want to go into the details of that. But there were some common, uh, they share common factors, like in all those five countries, the people, they were demanding or they calling for the fall of the regimes, all of them, in each one of them. Also, they share another common factor, which is in each one of those countries, the old regimes at that time, they all blamed external forces external powers or even terrorists that are the ones who are but not really that the people are the ones who are revolting but this is came from outside they are influenced to getting the people this was also they shared uh, you remember that also that uh, it's the monarchical regime or the monarchical regimes are the ones who supported those republics or those revolts in those countries, ironically speaking, for some political reasons, and especially that the monarchical regime really didn't witness or didn't use those, that violence or that corruption to the magnitude that has it on those five countries. Um, again, I will try to explain, because really on each of these I can speak for hours on that. Uh, let's go to the, now what uh, the United States, the changes that the United States foreign policy I, you observe, I mean, vis-a-vis -vis the, uh, the Arab countries, and then with the Arab League here since I came one year and a half ago. Uh, we find that the, the United States dealt, because the, the Arab Spring brought regimes or parties with Islamic tendencies, Islamic trends, and the United States had to deal with them. Uh, some of those uh, parties, even some elements in those parties, were on the terrorist list of the United States, and yet the United States said that now th 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 things have changed in those countries and we have to deal and we have to judge those leadership or those parties on their actions, but not on their affiliation or with their affiliations. Uh, that's why they invited uh, some Muslim representative of the parties here, uh, only one, I think, maybe less than one year ago or less than that. Uh, to come here from uh, from Tunisia, representative of the Islamic Party from Tunisia, from Morocco, from Algeria, from uh, Egypt, of course, mainly. And they were here and they met here and they are dealing with them. Nothing wrong with that, actually. Things have changed. They change. Why not? Also, the um, United States uh, start, uh, create, or Obama himself, the President Obama himself, created some initiatives that which are very also, I consider it a blessing, I mean, for, the, for our region and for the world. One of these uh, initiatives is the Open Government Partnership. You can go that on website, it has a lot of literature on that. It's new. It's all the two initiatives, really, mainly. They took place just with the advent of the Arab Spring, which shows you that the, the Arab Spring had influence, really, the foreign policy when it says the open government partnership, it's emphasize, it emphasizes the uh, accountability and responsibility 
and combating corruption and uh, technology and innovation and uh, uh, hoping that uh, some Arab countries will benefit from the open government uh, partnership which really emphasizes democracy, accountability, responsibility. Now it ended up with 57 members on those in this organization at 200 maybe non-governmental maybe one or two Arab countries only, Arab countries who joined, but I'm sure in the, uh, still, because they are still in transitional period, really, they will join one day, I'm sure. But it's a blessing. The other initiative also came with the advent of the Arab Spring, is the Atrocities Prevention Board, which again, this is targeted mainly the situation in Syria and in, uh, in Libya, uh, mainly, but of course you have uh, a, uh, when it was uh, created in 2011, September, I think, uh, uh, Ivory Coast was one, uh, Kyrgyzstan, I think, is another, uh, and of course, mainly, mainly Libya and Syria. Uh, this is also a blessing, I mean, the, they, 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 uh, the objective of this initiative is really to protect citizens everywhere and to bring the predators of those who committed atrocities against other people to the international uh, uh, criminal court. Uh, the new change for the first time in the history of the, re of the relationship between the Arab League and the United States is the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding, which this is the first time in the history of the relationship actually the United States never recognized the Arab League. It's only because the, the Arab League took unprecedented decisions and, and positions vis-a-vis -vis what's going on in, the, in those countries, like, for example, uh, 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 send it, sending monitors or observ observers to Syria, like uh, supporting NATO actions in Libya, like um, uh, requesting the Arab countries to draw their ambassadors from uh, from the, from uh, from uh, Libya and Syria, suspending for the first time in the history of the Arab League, for domestic reasons, sus uh, uh, suspending the membership of Syria and Libya in the Arab League. Uh, the, the the Arab League took positions, perhaps for the first time, which really the, while the Charter emphasizes sovereignty and independence of those countries, and intervention in those countries, and yet the Arab League took those positions which the United States felt very comfortable with what the, United, with what the Arab League took, correctly so. And uh, that's why we signed a memorandum of understanding. The memorandum was signed in September like this time, 25th actually, last year, in the United Nations, and I attended the, the signature of this uh, memorandum. It's now there is a, a channel, uh, or there is an, an, uh, it's the relationship between the United States and the Arab League is institutionalized. We have cooperation, we have uh, people, vis exchange of visitors between here and um, and uh, between he, uh, here and the, the Arab League in Cairo. And uh, there is the major uh, thing also that uh, I inaugurated with Secretary Hillary Clinton, the Open Book Project. This also makes, uh, translate books into Arabic uh, language and make it available online for uh, the Arab uh, uh, population, young people there everywhere. Uh, which is really, again, it's a blessing, and these are major changes in the policies of the, of the United uh, uh, States. Also, another major uh, change, uh, I'm trying to summarize things, is really the, uh, the revival of the peace process. I mean, now the United States, just a few months ago, took the, uh, it revived the initiative, the Arab Peace Initiative, it's uh, trying, uh, uh, Secretary Kerry was shuttling really between the Israelis and the Palestinians and uh, some Arab countries and we, they met here. I was with the League of Arab States delegation here when we met eight foreign ministers, Arab ministers with uh, Secretary uh, Kerry. Uh, we met here I think in April, end of April. And, uh, we were disc and we were we were discussing how to revive the, initi the peace initiative, and he did, and he went shuttling, and now they are in the ni ninth, I think, rounds of negotiations in the, between Ramallah and Jerusalem. Uh, the Palestinian and Israelis are negotiating. Of course, nothing was leaked from this negotiation. This was the condition that Kerry is the only one who would speak 
this, they try to avoid some of the loopholes of the previous negotiations. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, we will have peace uh, soon, uh, but I think they are, without the intervention of the United States, uh, I don't think anybody can uh, influence or can achieve peace in that area, the United States, because of the, its relationship strategically with the Israel. Of course, uh, the assistance that, that from the United States to Israel, and as you know, all of you, it's not a secret, it's a republic, of course, that the United States is committed really to the security of Israel, to make Israel at all times stronger than all the Arab countries combined at any time. Uh, uh, this is one. The other one is that uh, the, there is also the Iron Domes there. So the problem of security is not any more valid for the Israelis. It's really valid for the Arabs and the Palestinians who are insecure. So really this is one thing that uh, I feel that the United States is the only one that can influence the Israelis for peace. Because, uh, I mean, you have here a nation, uh, a land occupied the land and the people for 60 years. And now they are coming, of course, there are many voices now, Israeli and pro-Israelis, who are aware now of the fact that without a two-state solution, uh, we ca Israel will cease to be Jewish, Zionist, and democratic. Uh, there are many of them now. I hear I attend the many think tank organizations talking about that, correctly so, that it's against the values of Judaism. It's against the values of democracy, if, they, if it's a democratic country, to have, to, to end up with one state solution where the majorities are Palestinians who may not be able to have the right to vote. So really there are now voices, Israelis and pro-Israelis, who are wise enough to to admit that it's time now for a two-state solution and uh, that's why uh, I think President Kerry has emphasized the fact that there is no way that we can have a one-state solution. We are working on two-state uh, solution. Uh, I will not take much of the time, of this, of your time now, because I have my colleague also here, but I will uh, Ah, the United States, another change, the United States paid more attention to religion and faith. And maybe mainly to Islam, let's say. I mean, the United States has an envoy now, maybe between eight, 2008, 2009, and recently even they have one commissioner, an interfaith uh, uh, state, an inter interfaith commission, they call it, I think. Uh, they have one, it's about religion in general, but maybe they meant Islam and basically they have an envoy, the rank of ambassador to the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. They have a lady who is also in the State Department. She is in charge of uh, Islam, Muslim, Islamic minorities everywhere uh, abroad. Uh, it shows that there is a concern. It's okay, again, it's a blessing that they, are, they, uh, they pay attention to that. But Religion or Islam, whatever, is not the reason for what's going on. It's really the policies of the country itself. So now, what is, what is it really? Is it Islam? Is it Judaism? Is it Christianity, the cause of what's going on? Now I move to terrorism, if you, if you want, that's why I link this. So there are, of course, uh, uh, it's not really religion because it's, I feel, I don't I didn't know whether you found in your center here the reasons of terrorism. I didn't find. Whether you define terrorism, I don't know. I don't think there is any definition exactly how do you define it unless you tell me later. But it's, uh, it's uh, really difficult. Uh, if, you, if, if some countries think religion is the reason, it's not. Because Judaism and Islam, Christianity, they share so many values. That really, uh, so it's not really that... Uh, uh, because Muslim Christians and Jews are all people of the book, Judaism, Islam, Christianity share a common monotheistic vision, a belief in one's divine God, in the transience of uh, our earthly life, in our accountability of our actions, and in the assurances of life to come. We share many key values in common, in respect of knowledge, for justice, compassion towards, uh, um, compassion towards the poor and the underprivileged, the importance of life, and respect of parents. The Quran, 
honor thy father and mothers, and even the mother three, he mentioned mother three times for some reasons. Uh, within uh, the framework of the interna of international efforts to combat terrorism, it is imperative to resolve the Palestinian, this is what I believe, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. I don't want to link the pal Palestinian-Israeli conflict to terrorism. I cannot and I will not do it, but grievances can lead to violence. Injustices can lead to violence. Of course, there are many, p they say there are other reasons, poverty. I mean, I didn't find really one single reason. It's a whole, so many of reasons that really uh, lead to violence. So here, I believe it's imperative to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, which is one of the causes of instability and insecurity in the region. Also, by resolving the conflict in the Middle East, we will deny terrorists the possibility of using this noble cause for their own evil objectives. By the way, the, Ar the Arab Spring countries, they were uh, now in Syria, they say they are fighting terrorists. Still, they don't admit they are fighting uh, uh, population, Syrian population, who are really revolting against the gre their grievances, against the regime. Uh, you find also uh, in Yemen, they are saying that you are fighting terrorists. In Tunisia, even, they said you are fighting terrorists. So terrorism has been used everywhere. And even it has been used to violate human rights in some countries. So we have to be careful when we use that word. That's why I think we need to have a definition, but I doubt that we will have one that we will agree upon. Uh, also, when it comes to Muslims and the West, I mean, you have 57 uh, uh, Muslim countries in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation. Not even a single one is in a conflict or in war with the West. If you want to mention Iraq, it had no problem with the West until it invaded Kuwait. If you want to mention Iran as a Muslim country, in, Iran enjoyed and it has, it has been enjoying a cordial relations with the West until it started exporting its revolution or this is what they announced when they took over. So there is no really one definite reason for these conflicts or clashes or uh, some believe in equalities, poverty, and so on. I will quote you here. Um, during the World Economic Forum in 2002, just a few months after the 9-11, uh, many of heads of state at that conference and foreign ministers, including American Secretary of State then, Mr. Colin Powell, called for a coalition against poverty that should follow the, that, that should follow the coalition to combat terrorism. He said, terrorism really flourishes in areas of poverty, despair, and hopelessness, where people see no future. Secretary Powell added that we should fight poverty which feeds terrorism. Many in the forum called for a more just and far and, and fair globalization. And we're talking about poverty. I was in Mali. Mali, when I was there in 1986, uh, 87, I stayed there for five, six years. Uh, is, uh, when I was there, it was uh, the per capita income was $200 when I was there. And yet, I stayed seven years there. I, none of the violence there. Nobody has stolen anything there. I, you can leave your home open and nobody will enter that. And yet this is one of the poorest countries in the world. What is it then? Does poverty really uh, lead to terrorism? You cannot say that. Maybe the ambassador will elaborate on what's going on recently. That's different. But when I was there, it was a stable, a very safe, very secure country with 200 per capita income. I don't know, Mamun Ambassador, how, what, uh, what is the per capita now? Anka, maybe 1,000, 2,000? It doesn't progress. Uh, yeah. Anyway, we will talk about that. I will leave it to you. Uh, now, uh, a major country, that's Saudi Arabia, really, because there are many people who are recruited. I don't know the reason the, from there, but, of course, we are trying to 
We are the ones, we in Saudi Arabia, we are the ones who suffered from terrorism. That's why we have rehabilitation centers in Saudi Arabia, one center or two centers, that really was effective. And even the United States is trying to learn from that center. How can they deal? Of course, this center, it, uh, it has some, so many those who are deviants, who don't call them terrorists because they haven't yet, many of them didn't commit any terrorist actions, but uh, we are, they are, uh, we think that they are dangerous, they were detained, and they are in that rehabilitation center. Some of them even terrorists who didn't commit yet any, uh, any terrorist actions. They are uh, in that center, it's uh, maybe, it's not 100% effective, maybe 6 or 7 or 10 of, 10 percent of them they don't really they go back to terrorism and so on but it's very effective uh, really institution that helped a lot really to come back to the fold of societies and they are adjusted back they are rehabilitated um, and uh, i hope this is also the united states studying i mean how to uh, to also to solve this problem of terrorism through some kind of rehabilitations. I will leave you just uh, at that, I think. I took much time. Of, uh, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. you. come here so I will. <laughs> Thank you very much, Thank you very much uh, <coughs> Ambassador Al-Sharif for uh, your uh, analysis and to discuss uh, the broader security uh, uh, issues all the way from the, um, the Arab Spring of decade of awakening uh, to the peace process and uh, what was really intriguing uh, about the role of religion and uh, in terms of how can religion advance the cause of peace with justice whether it is Islam or Judaism or Christianity and uh, we have a common ground on that as you know if we look at the Quran and we can see uh, if you want peace give them peace and trust in God and uh, whoever saves one life it deems as if you save the whole world it is in Islam in Judaism Christianity so we have a common ground to deal with that now we're going to move on to a particular uh, issue related to uh, North Africa the soil and West Africa we published a study that would be available uh, to you if you're uh, interested and we focus particularly on the uh, issue in, uh, in Mali uh, this year and what happened in Algiers, uh, the takeover of the uh, gas facility and what's going on now uh, elsewhere in Libya and Morocco. And so uh, we are very fortunate again to have Ambassador Kaita, uh, who um, was generous to join us um, on September 11 right here to discuss the lessons of 9-11 and uh, we're very very grateful to him to come and to continue to enlighten us particularly on what's what's happening uh, in the region in general and um, in, in the aftermath of uh, the Nairobi uh, attack uh, which is not over as we say but what are some of the lessons uh, from Nairobi and uh, of course and what's happening uh, elsewhere. Ambassador um, Kaita is, um, as an ambassador, he was in Kenya and Uganda and Tanzania and Djibouti in the whole uh, region in East uh, Africa and Ethiopia. He knows the region very well as, as far as uh, the other areas in uh, Africa and he served in many of these uh, countries. He was educated in uh, Egypt and uh, lectured extensively, published extensively. Again, it is a great honor to have you, Ambassador Kaita, to join us. Thank you so much. 
помочь. Good afternoon, everybody. And uh, let me thank our host, uh, Professor Michael uh, Sweetnam and Professor uh, Yona Alexander for holding this uh, seminar. Uh, but more uh, importantly, for their consistent uh, leadership in drawing attention to the current and future threat of terrorism. This uh, two individuals in particular have done a tremendous job of developing response strategies uh, on governmental and non-governmental uh, levels and educating on the nature and intensity of the terrorism uh, tree. So thank you so much. It's my privilege to be here uh, with such uh, distinguished speakers, including uh, the ambassador of uh, the League of Arab States uh, to the United States, His Excellency Mohammed Al Husseini Al Sharif. It's uh, very nice uh, to meet uh, with uh, Al Sharif almost more than 30 years uh, when we met uh, for the first time ago in, uh, in Bamako. And it's my privilege also uh, to, uh, to be here with uh, the uh, Deputy Chief of Mission of the Embassy of Lithuania, Honorable uh, Simonas uh, Satinas. I would like to take uh, this opportunity to provide uh, some comments on the African countries' concerns about uh, combating terrorism in light of the Kenya uh, attack implications. So, I intend to cover the terrorism uh, treat in Africa in three parts. First, the implications of the horrific uh, terrorist attack by Al-Shabaab on uh, the Westgate uh, shopping mall in uh, Nairobi this week. Second, Al-Qaeda's uh, ties in Africa. And finally, the next phase of international cooperation in combating terrorism. I start with the horrific attack uh, by uh, Al-Shabaab the uh, Somali militia uh, linked to Al-Qaeda on the Westgate uh, Mall in uh, Nairobi. Uh, this attack was the worst tragedy to strike Kenya since the 1998 U.S. embassy bombing. As you may uh, remember, uh, a year ago, uh, Kenyan forces seized Al-Shabaab's final stronghold, the Somali port of Kismayo, sending the group into the country's rural interior and cutting off the, uh, their economic lifeline. A long and a brutal uh, war against a slippery enemy, it seemed, was nearly won. Sadly, uh, that has not proved to be the case. On Saturday, September 21st, gunmen from Al-Shabaab, the Somali-based terror linked to Al-Qaeda, launched a bloody attack and randomly uh, opened fire on choppers uh, enjoying their weekend. This deadliest attack ended with more than 200 casualties, including 70 civilians and six Kenyan soldiers killed. Five terrorists were killed and, other, and another uh, 11 suspects are arrested. Foreign assistance teams from the United States, United Kingdom and Israel are reportedly uh, on the scene actually with some possibility uh, deploying from bases through uh, Kenya where foreign forces have been conducting training and other operations for years. In the meantime, Al-Shabaab has uh, claimed via Twitter to have several teams uh, of operatives deployed inside Kenya to attack secondary uh, targets. In fact, according to Kenyan police officials, there were two attacks. The first last Wednesday night on a group of police officers on a foot patrol in Wajir, in which a bystander was killed. Militants struck again uh, early on Thursday, today, 
raiding a police camp in uh, Mandera, killing two police officers and setting fire to a dozen vehicles. And not so, uh, surprisingly, the group now threatens attacks in Europe and the U.S. In addition, the media has reported that there is evidence Al-Shabaab is running a chemical weapons uh, research and development department. The Westgate attack is the gravest act of terror on Kenyan soil since uh, Kenyan uh, forces invaded Somalia in October uh, 2011 to join the other troops of the African Union mission in Somalia, Amisom, in combating Al-Shabaab. At this time, Al-Shabaab warned uh, of bloody reprisals against Kenya. The timing of the terrorist attack on Nairobi's Westgate shopping mall is also notable and comes on the heels of territorial losses for the group in Mogadishu and Kismayo as the Somali government uh, and African military forces under the umbrella of the African Union mission in Somalia with Western uh, support have continued to uh, disrupt and degrade Al-Shabaab. This offensive push has uh, strained the group's resources and has pushed it to adopt more guerrilla style tactics as opposed to conventional uh, attempts to gain and hold territory. Since Al-Shabaab formally joined with uh, Al-Qaeda in, uh, uh, in 2007, it has developed a coherent goal beyond expelling the infidels from Somalia to include global uh, jihad. Attacks inside Kenya have occurred periodically in recent years, but they have been limited to the border area near uh, Garissa or uh, where the work of Al-Shabaab sympathizers in Nairobi's uh, East uh, dis District, making this uh, most uh, recent attack a clear shift by Al-Shabaab to stage a larger attack in a vulnerable yet higher uh, profile area that would demonstrate its ongoing credibility and counter criticism that it has uh, defeated. But the scale and technical uh, sophistication of the Nairobi attack could signal a change in Al Shabaab's aspirations, possibly increasing the group's direct threat to the United States. Actually, the perceptions of apparent uh, progress in Somalia may be seriously, uh, seriously compromised by the Nairobi attack. In fact, successive international interventions, including the African Union mission in Somalia, Amisom, Kenyan and Ethiopian armed forces, and the most recent United Nations assistance mission in uh, Somalia, UNISOM, developed in July have all failed to contain security situation in the country. And it's now clear that Al-Shabaab, based on September 21st uh, attack in Nairobi, is just the latest step in, uh, in its evolution from leader of an Islamic state in Somalia to a regional Islamist terror movement spreading its uh, tentacles uh, through the Horn of Africa. My second point is about Al-Qaeda's ties in Africa and, uh, as you know, the co uh, consequences of terrorism and insurgency, ins insurgency uh, such as the Nairobi's attack, is devastating for the African states affected by it. The Nairobi attack marks the continuation of a disturbing trend in a growing number of countries and regions in north, uh, northern and uh, sub Saharan Africa and should be understood in the light of uh, the, uh, the blood soaked global jihadist campaign of the Al Qaeda terrorist organization. And in general, all groups affiliated with uh, Al Qaeda terrorist uh, network are especially prone to lethal and uh, high casualty attacks. Recent events in the Sahel region including the coup and insurgency in Mali, the emergence of uh, a security vacuum following the revolution in Libya and terrorist attacks in Algeria and Niger, among other places, underscore the particular threat 
uh, posed by violent, violent uh, extremism, especially Al-Qaeda in Islamic Maghreb. The last year or so has seen an intensification of the Boko Haram insurgency in Nigeria and Islamic Jihad in Mali and attacks on a natural gas uh, facility in Algeria. It should be recalled that in uh, 2012, the U.S. military officials uh, warned that these jihadist outfits were increasingly joining forces to coordinate and sophisticate their violent attacks. Al-Shabaab's continued terrorist activity is not detached from that of other jihadist groups in Africa, including Boko Haram, Ansaru, and Al-Qaeda. Uh, North Africa uh, wing, EQIM. Al-Shabaab have also been linked to the training of Nigeria's Islamist terrorist group Boko Haram, which has killed over, uh, over 10,000 people since its founding in uh, 2002. Al-Shabaab may also be compared to Nigeria's splinter Islamist group Jamaat Ansar al-Muslimin in uh, al-Sudan, which emerged in uh, the Muslim North Nigeria in, um, in uh, 2012, also Ansaru, uh, as the group uh, is commonly known, uh, kidnapped and uh, later killed seven foreigners. According to a statement reportedly released by the group, the kidnappings and killings were a response to attacks against Islam by European countries in places like Afghanistan and uh, Mali. Uh, about the current status and the next phase of international cooperation in combating uh, terrorism, uh, as you may know, on uh, the wider scene, uh, Al-Qaeda still uh, wields considerable ideological influence in many countries, including in Africa and Asia. It is uh, adept at, uh, uh, at opportunistically exploiting local uh, political developments to win over new uh, sympathizers. The terrorism threat has also morphed, posing greater uh, challenges to security agencies. Terrorist splinter groups like the uh, Boko Haram in Nigeria and Al Shabaab in Somalia have multiplied. Uh, these groups exploit extremist sentiments or profess allegiance with Al Qaeda even uh, when their objectives uh, differ. Their fragmented, nebulous nature makes them harder to pin down and neutralize. Fears about Africa's emergence as uh, a terror haven are unlikely to uh, subside anytime soon. Africa's Islamists are able to take uh, advantage of the fact that many of the continent's countries uh, have porous borders, weak and corrupt central governments, undertained and uh, under uh, equipped militaries, flourishing drug trades that provide a steady source of uh, income. Those are precisely the reasons, along with a trove of Libyan weapons, Islamists were able to conquer northern Mali and use it as a base for planning the strikes on the uranium mine in Niger and the natural gas plant in Algeria. Those are also the reasons American officials worry that a successful terror attack in the U.S. or Europe land in Africa and carried out by African extremists is only a matter of time. The new face of militant Islam in, uh, or in our world is likely to be an African one. An increasingly uh, globalized world like ours, this is the last point, our uh, uh, globalized world like uh, ours easily enhances the spread of uh, terrorism beyond borders. As uh, the recent Westgate uh, attack in Kenya demonstrates, uh, blurring the distinction between domestic and transnational terrorism. The next phase of international cooperation in combating uh, uh, terrorism is extremely uh, important. So uh, let me 
uh, now briefly touch upon uh, some security cooperation actions for the future. Uh, terrorism is likely to remain a shared security challenge for the international community in the foreseeable uh, future. I believe we will see more of it, not less. As you may know, resolving terrorism therefore requires a coordinated response that fuses domestic regional and international strategies along the lines of diplomacy, development, and uh, demilitarization. Declared wars and terror, including missile strikes, state terror, assassination, and invasion, have only a limited capacity to root out Islamist terrorism because they fail to engage uh, with the underlying existing, existing, existing potential uh, conditions and unifying ideologies that can uh, shape jihadist uh, groups like Al-Shabaab, uh, Boko Haram, Ansaru, and Al-Qaeda. Uh, we reject the static quo and develop a violent pedagogy that aims for maximum casualties. As you may know also, uh, dealing effectively with terrorism in the long term requires evidence and intelligence-based criminal justice responses aimed at arresting and uh, prosecuting the perpetrators. Experience demonstrates that a purely uh, military response can have uh, unintended consequences, including the risk uh, of fueling extremism and forced acts of terrorism. In these perspectives, uh, we must first enhance operational capabilities uh, we must build strong operational capabilities. We cannot afford actually to assume that uh, no terrorist threat will materialize. We need to be able to pick up intelligence leads, uh, pursue them uh, through, uh, thoroughly and nip emerging threats in the bud. Two, we must strengthen international cooperation. We need close international security cooperation Terrorism is a global threat and uh, terrorist groups do not respect international borders. Uh, therefore, counter-terrorism forces must also collaborate internationally. Three, international cooperation also includes sharing experiences at meetings like uh, this. Four, we must continue to promote the formulation and implementation of a long-term comprehensive approach to countering uh, terrorism compliant with uh, human rights and international law. Five, we must seek to remain on the cutting edge of uh, counterterrorism, not only by developing existing programs and pro projects, but also by identifying emerging threats and innovative responses. In particular, we must continue promoting public-private partnerships in uh, countering terrorism. Six, while the Sahel uh, remains uh, vulnerable, the United States has over the past two years provided more than $620 uh, million in assistance to uh, the Sahel. This is in addition to uh, $93 million in 2013 to support the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership. In this context, the United States should also continue to work through the Global Counterterrorism Forum to identify capacity building needs in the region and mobilize the necessary support and expertise uh, needed to meet these uh, challenges. And I would like to take this opportunity uh, finally uh, to uh, appreciate the approval yesterday in, uh, at the United Nations of the integrated strategy uh, for uh, security and development in, uh, in the Sahel. In conclusion, I would like to uh, leave you with um, one thought. Terrorism is a truly global issue in which we all have uh, a stake. International cooperation is indispensable. We are all in the same boat. I thank you for your attention. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I really appreciate it. We have a couple of gifts for you. Okay. Uh, emblem of the Potomac Institute and a couple. We've given you the books already. So <laughs> thank you very much. Sir. Thank you so much. I this is for my coffee. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
Assum. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador. Mm -hmm. for your um, insights, particularly what's uh, happening uh, in uh, Africa. And um, um, I, I think what is uh, really critical to keep in mind, as you mentioned, the globalization of the threats and the globalization of response. And in fact, as we move on to the next uh, speaker uh, on the European Union, uh, the counterterrorism on that particular issue to combat terrorism globally from their perspective, their commitment and to respect uh, human rights and to make Europe uh, safer and to allow the citizens to, to live in freedom, security and justice. So we see the commonality in terms of the response and we are again privileged to have uh, Honorable Simonas Satonas who is the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Lithuanian uh, Embassy uh, to the U.S. Uh, he has also a very rich uh, background um, around the world and in Lithuania itself uh, dealing with some, some of these uh, issues and what is uh, particularly important now to deal with not only the perspective of Lithuania as a state but also in its role as presidency of the European Union to speak uh, for the other members uh, of the Union and I, I ask him actually to discuss the agenda for the presidency of the European Union which obviously includes broader security uh, issues as well as political and economic and strategic. So uh, please come here, it would be much easier. He has a uh, presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. Thank you very much. How I need to move from one slide to another? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Yes, I'm Simona Shotunas from the Embassy of Lithuania here in Washington. And it's my great pleasure, and I'm really humbled to be here in this uh, think tank. And thank you, the leadership of think tank, uh, and uh, thank you, my honored uh, colleagues, uh, the ambassadors on the panel. Uh, the topic is really interesting, important. Uh, maybe we, like Lithuanians, we're not dealing it, uh, with it every day, but definitely it's uh, on our global agenda and our EU presidency agenda as well. Uh, I was thinking, and thank you for the opportunity, maybe very, very quickly to go through the presidency. What does it mean, the presidency for this small uh, country? We are, as you know, uh, independent country for 20 years when we restored our independence from the uh, departing from Soviet Union. So we, the Baltic state uh, up in the north of Europe, we're the first country, the first uh, from the Baltic states to lead European Union. And definitely we have a certain agenda, but uh, the presidency for the country means uh, try to coordinate as much as we can, try to lead a lot of uh, working discussions in Brussels uh, and uh, on many, many topics and many issues. So economic agenda is a big uh, and very detailed and very challenging, uh, but also foreign policy, which as you know, after the uh, reforms and after Lisbon Treaty was uh, introduced back in 2007, uh, there are some reforms and foreign policies led by the European Commission and High Representative for Foreign Policy, <laughs> Catherine Ashton at the moment, but the member states uh, really having a, every day a very, very in-depth discussions in Brussels and global and many, many issues. So I thought I will maybe run very, very quickly for you just to see uh, our agenda of the presidency and then uh, maybe I'll try to highlight some of the items uh, on, on the European Union agenda on the counterterrorism strategy which was adopted in 2007. Uh, so basically 
Uh, this year for our presidency is important and very, very challenging because next year European Parliament will have uh, new elections. Uh, so this is like a, one of the final cycles of European Union while we're trying to push a lot of legislation which is important for economic development and economic reforms within European Union until the European Parliament elections in 2014 in May. The most important thing is really that European Union we're debating or trying to push through the, uh, the so-called the multi annual financial framework which is the uh, basically the document uh, basically the guidelines how European Union is going to function and allocate the funds uh, for the next uh, seven years uh, as you can see some unexpected uh, topics always is uh, raising uh, for the presidency and we need to deal with it even though we were probably not putting that like uh, our priority but uh, this is how the reality is working uh, the focus of our president was really to keep the Europe running, uh, making reforms and uh, being uh, credible, growing and open. Probably the most important for this audience would be to discuss the what does it mean to keep it open. Uh, these are more a little bit of uh, what we're trying to do and what European Union is trying to do in the, uh, in the economic, in terms of the economic uh, development and making the economy more uh, ready to grow and to, to, to to solve the economic challenges. It's uh, a lot of efforts, a lot of very concrete um, policies that we need to push, ranging from the fiscal, from banking union, completing the single um, uh, energy market, in, uh, which is uh, uh, completing dig digital agenda, air transport, everything. So it's, it's every day creating the more and more integrated, more and more deeper uh, uh, EU single market. Let's say even EU internal energy market is still not finished. So we are going through and we hope that until the end of this year we'll have the final reg legislation in place that will lead us then to the uh, com physical completion project and so on. Uh, so it's just uh, now the most important probably is to discuss Europe is evolving, Europe is open and Europe is ready to cooperate with the world. So now, as you know, Croatia in 1st of July joined European Union. We are working very hard with our Eastern uh, European uh, countries, uh, which is ranging Ukraine, Moldova, Caucasus countries, and Belarus, how to bring them closely and how to really uh, set up the agenda for the next uh, decades, uh, clo bringing closer, closer these markets and these countries to European Union. And also definitely trade negotiations, which are very important topic in this capital and in Brussels as well and we believe that uh, trade negotiations might really create a better transatlantic relations and deeper and really create a more opportunities for economic growth. Uh, so, I'm sorry maybe I'll go a little bit. So I wanted maybe to Strengthen the Eastern Partnership. What does it mean? It, uh, Eastern Partnership probably the biggest, uh, b the biggest event that Lithuanian presidency will have. It will be at the end of uh, November. We will have uh, all European Union leaders coming to Vilnius, to our capital, and also the six uh, leaders of Eastern European countries coming to sign the critical agreements. Uh, some of them, let's say, we hope that finally Ukraine will be able to sign the association agreement, which is basically the free trade agreement and uh, then we'll start the provisional application. The same is with Georgia, the same is with Moldova. So these countries, they f finished their negotiations on free trade with the European Union, but uh, we need to sign, we need to start to implement. And these uh, association agreements, they are really going to impact very, very positively to the immediate neighbors of us. So we will already start to transposing the European Union a key into the markets of these uh, countries. That will create a really a tot totally different picture, much uh, stable legal environment, much open. The trade barriers will start to be uh, will start uh, to be removed uh, gradually. Uh, we have been going to uh, this direction for decades. We hope it will be a successful, and that will be probably the biggest achievement of our presidency. Uh, these are some. Uh, key numbers about EU presidency and just, you know, the country, the small country of 3 million people, we need to really lead a lot of bureaucratic meetings, a lot of discussion and try to push the legislation which is important for our all mm, uh, EU presidency.
so it's uh, more information about us. And uh, now I wanted to touch base about the counterterrorism. Uh, so as you know, European Union has adopted the counterterrorism strategy in 2005. Uh, you can really find this robust document online. Uh, basically, uh, we we have. Um, we have um, discussed our actions around the four objectives, which is the prevention, uh, protection, pursuit, and response. So, you know, all these three, uh, four packages, uh, I, I see Professor Alexander has uh, very well. So there are certain actions that we think it's important to develop, uh, try to really mm, to fight the basic uh, fundamental issues. I have not heard uh, now yet in the, the, this discussion the word radicalization, but probably radicalization in our view is probably one of the most important and challenging thing for all the international community. The question is why it's happening and how to combat. So uh, it's the most important thing in these days as well. While we see some tendencies uh, that uh, even the EU passport holders are being recruited and uh, using various means of propaganda really to uh, to move themselves into, into the other regions of the world and to <coughs> to be recruited to do some uh, unexpected um, efforts and to join some uh, illegal uh, acts. So this is the, probably the biggest issue and. Uh, Already in July, European Union ministers of justice, they were debating this issue and the concrete action plan, what should be done. Then protection is, uh, it's uh, so important for the member states to, be, to have more and more information uh, on our external borders, who is coming, who is leaving. So as you know, Schengen information system was created among the member states, not maybe all yet, but the key, the biggest group of the member states which allows to really exchange very quickly information about uh, of, uh, the uh, visitors into European Union uh, area. Then pursuit of the terrorists across the borders, it's uh, really important. That's why a number of various uh, institutions, starting from Europol, Frontex, and Eurojustice, they were created really to increase the cooperation among the member states. And the response, and response, we believe that response should be multifaced uh, from the uh, really uh, law enforcement efforts towards the development assistance and uh, we need to think about a really necessary nexus between the law enforcement, human rights and development assistance that would help the countries that are really uh, seeing the insurgence of the, um, of the instability or the radical movements uh, to combat uh, using various means. So every, uh, this strategy was uh, adopted in 2005. Uh, as you know, European Union has now the uh, coordinator for the uh, fighting uh, the terrorism. Uh, he was, uh, I believe, uh, appointed 2007 or, or eight. But mainly it's how to increase the member states' uh, coordination and cooperation among themselves and, and really trying to share the information and also how to help uh, European Union uh, as the group of uh, countries to work with the other regions in the world, really not only sharing the experience but also sharing the budgets and, um, and our efforts. And um, probably you know that in, e in each of the package of all these uh, counterterrorism strategy there are uh, robust action plans that allows uh, European Union from, uh, from the budget really allocate substantial sums of money to towards the certain regions and to really work on the certain issues. So it's, um, there are strategies for Horn and Africa, for Sahel and the other regions. And uh, basically what uh, these programs are allocated for, they're allocated for really, we need to, to work and we understand the importance and the issue of uh, financing uh, of uh, illegal, uh, we, but it's critical financing of the terrorist organization. So anti-money laundering uh, and uh, counter-terrorism financing is one of the topics that uh, we all are supporting. Then counter radicalization that they were talking, the other projects are also uh, financed and supported in uh, Honor Africa. Law enforcement is uh, so much important uh, to help the countries that are g undergoing on the reforms or external challenges and, and not uh, to allow their well institutions to get weakened because of external or internal challenges. Border management capacity is one of the uh, also 
topics and agendas for us that we need to all to keep it very uh, close to our minds. Uh, so your union is supporting quite a number of the projects of this, how to increase and how to co better strengthen the operation of uh, uh, cross-border uh, crossing points. And uh, in case of uh, uh, in Mali, uh, as you know, you training uh, mission in Mali is also uh, uh, aimed at uh, strengthening the capacity of the Mali efforts to uh, be ready or to re rebuild the capacity. So uh, there are a lot of uh, efforts there. Uh, ongoing discussion is going on. Basically, when we look at the internal issues that European Union might, uh, member states might uh, face, it's uh, the counterterrorism and uh, law enforcement capabilities lies with the member states. Uh, in external actions, uh, as you know, we're trying to cooperate and, uh, under the CSDP, so-called uh, um, Common Security and Defense Policy Framework. So it's an it's a ongoing process, uh, and uh, we really are aware of uh, our immediate neighborhood global challenges and the basic uh, fundamental uh, uh, problems. That's why we are trying to do our best and really to work with the international community and I think it's only international community, only even the events like this, it's so much important to discuss and to see what the countries are lacking, what the countries, uh, what kind of a challenges they're seeing and what international community could do together. European Union, uh, as you can see from the practice working together with NATO and, Europe and United Nations efforts, try to be ready to respond. So these are basically my comments. Uh, but uh, I, I'm sure you can find a lot of robust information on the websites of European Union and member states, what efforts, what projects we are ready to co-finance, uh, and uh, we are co-financing now. So thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much, Mr. Satunov, for your presentation. Uh, incidentally, uh, you, you mentioned uh, Dr. Kirchhoff, who is the uh, coordinator, and we had the uh, honor, when I say we academically, uh, to, uh, to work with him. Uh, the European Union uh, infected the uh, parliament to um, discuss these issues and we're continuing with these uh, relationships. Uh, now before we open it up for uh, discussion, I would like to, to recognize uh, <coughs> um, Abdul Wahim Wahali, who is uh, Deputy Chief of Mission of the M Embassy of Morocco, uh, for the reason because uh, Morocco plays uh, a key role uh, obviously in this area and uh, most recently there were a number of uh, arrests in Morocco of uh, plots to attack despite the fact that uh, Morocco tried to provide uh, stability um, with uh, justice that uh, really goes back to the reforms of uh, the, the king uh, about 10 years ago. So if you don't mind to I'll say a few words up here in regard to the situation from your perspective. Thank you, Professor, for allowing me to uh, bring Morocco's view to this uh, interesting topics. And good afternoon, everybody. Sorry. No. Well, I, I, I won't be long. I just want to start actually if the, uh, I mean f from the topic of this uh, of this meeting international cooperation in combating terrorism the next phase personally speaking actually I think there is there's no no next phase it's only one one phase is never stop raising awareness of the phenomenon it's carrying on in a process of reforms to combat the extremism narratives and to call for international and regional cooperation. Uh, I think uh, Morocco's approach in this, uh, in this field 
uh, is not based only on security measures, but on a proactive policy based on many components, such as public awareness by sensitizing the large public to the dangers of extremism, security and intelligence leading to dismantlement of many terrorist cells, that was the case in Morocco, and economic and human resources development to create socio-economic conditions to prevent especially young people from falling into extremism. Reform of the religious field. This is a very important topic. Uh, uh, Ambassador Al Husseini earlier spoke about the religion. It is very important uh, to reform our religious field in, in order to combat the extremism narratives and to promote an open and tolerant Islam and then international and, and regional cooperation, not only in security field, but in building what we can call soft power. And I'm glad that Ambassador Keita is here. Uh, during the, the visit of His Majesty King Mohammed VI to Mali a few days ago, we signed an agreement to train Mali preachers. This is a very important topic. Since many extremism are using Islam to, to recruit people, and we need to, fo I mean, to form this, uh, I mean, the, the preachers in mosques and so on to promote an image of, of a tolerant Islam and to combat these narratives. And uh, this effort, unfortunately, uh, a few days ago, and it was on the 11th of September, and you will all, all make the link between this famous date, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb threatened Morocco through a videotape uh, it's a 41-minute video about, uh, I mean, criticizing in Morocco. It's an unprecedented move of Al-Qaeda uh, against Morocco. The video does not crit only criticize Morocco's policy uh, on international and domestic level, but goes against its model of an open society, an open and tolerant society. And, uh, and it tried as well to mock actually the, the Morocco's effort in, uh, in the field of uh, combating terrorism, like criticizing Morocco by, uh, by, showing the king, uh, by showing the king meeting former President George Bush, or by uh, meeting with, uh, with French President Francois Hollande in an uh, indication to the war in, uh, against uh, terrorists in northern Mali. So it's uh, it's a very important, uh, I mean, the, uh, struggle that we have to, to all, I mean, pay attention to. And uh, unfortunately, this kind of, uh, of, uh, of videos and so on, we find sometimes, uh, uh, I mean, um, uh, a propaganda or, or a publicity from some, some media and news, and that goes against it's not, it's not about, it's not an attempt to any freedom of press of, or ex expression, but it goes actually against the Vienna Declaration uh, of 2009, which uh, insisted on freedom of the press at the condition of abstaining from any form of incitement to terrorism. And it's as well against the UN resolution, especially the 1624 resolution of 2005, which can uh, condemn any attempt of justification or glorification of terrorist acts, and which call in the state to prevent terrorists from exploiting sophisticated, uh, sophisticated technology, communication, and resources to incite support for criminal acts. And it's again against the uh, European Council of Human Rights, and I would like to uh, raise here the case involving the publication of ideas through the media calling for terrorism uh, I mean, from terrorism. So it's, once again, uh, the only way, I mean, personally speaking, the only way to combat terrorism is through domestic policy calling for openness, tolerance, socioeconomic uh, improvement of, of lives of people in order to prevent them to fall into extremists. And then on the other side, to more responsible media. 
and then through international and regional cooperation, we've been always asking for the cooperation among the countries of the Maghreb, cooperation with the Sahel, uh, I mean the African Sahel countries, as well as with international organizations. And thank you once again. Uh, we, we really appreciate uh, very much uh, your comments, and I, I would like to, to call uh, on Ambassador Javier Perez, uh, who was the Ambassador of Spain uh, in Washington, as well uh, as uh, Director of the Counterterrorism Activities at the United Nations. Would you like to say a few words, please? Uh, thank you, Professor Alexander. Thank you to you all. Uh, th there is not much I have to add to these uh, very excellent presentations that we've been listening to. And uh, uh, certainly uh, the, the, the title of this gathering, International Cooperation in Combating Terrorism, the next phase, offers us already a good uh, reminder of what we have to look into. And uh, I think the next phase is probably what we've been seeing in Kenya and Nairobi these last few days, which is a very determined effort on the part of terrorist uh, groups uh, to destabilize a significant part of, of Africa. And uh, I think that we have to try and get together and uh, develop a new kind of uh, international cooperation just to prevent the, this serious uh, destabilization effort in the whole African continent. But let me uh, make just three very short points on some of the references that uh, have been made in uh, today. First of all, the, defini the definition of terrorism. We are not going to get a, uh, we are not going to get the definition of terrorism soon, but we shouldn't be concerned about that lack of definition of terrorism because we know very well what terrorism is about. We do uh, recognize terrorism whenever it appears. So we shouldn't be over concerned about that lack of proper definition of terrorism because any one of us around here, around the world, would find out the word just to define terrorism. Because we do not have that definition of terrorism, but we do have a very complete list of international agreements against acts of terrorism. Practi practically all the acts of terrorism have been already covered by those international agreements. So whenever someone tries to justify any act of terrorism because of the lack of that uh, definition of terrorism, we might as well tell him that uh, there is no need for that, uh, uh, that definition of terrorism to act against uh, acts of terror. The second point, which is um, closely related to the definition of terrorism, is the, the causes of terrorism. We have to uh, try and, and uh, forbid ourselves to get too deep into the causes of terrorism, because whatever those causes are, terrorism can never be justified. Were we to try and wait for all those causes of terrorism to be uh, to be met, to be solved, we would be we would be never able to fight terrorism. Whatever is poverty, whatever is uh, social problems, there is never a justification for terrorism. And as uh, uh, as one of the speakers before pointed out. It's not poverty which causes terrorism. As a matter of fact, terrorism is not, are not precisely the downtrodden of the earth. If we look into the background of those involved in terrorism, we, 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 we uh, find out that they are precisely those people who have quite a, a, a wealthy way of living. And uh, so let's try and repeat all over again that there is never a justification for terrorism, that there is never a justification for acts of violence with political ends and means, and that uh, whatever the reason behind those acts, there is never a justification or an understanding for the acts of terrorism. 
And the third and final point I would like to, uh, to make, and uh, it was already pointed out by the Deputy Chief of Mission of the Lithuanian Embassy, is that uh, we should try and look into the radicalization processes that many of the terrorists around the world are going through right now. Uh, probably we uh, know quite a lot about those processes. We should look into uh, deeper into those processes because probably some of the, not causes, but some of the reasons why those people decide to engage in terrorist activities have to, um, are closely related to those radicalization processes. I think the European Union is, uh, uh, is been looking into that with uh, a significant degree of interest, among other things, because uh, the European countries are, uh, uh, are seeing in, in their own societies the problems and the dangers of those radicalization processes. But I think it, uh, it affects all of us, certainly it does affect the United States of America as well, when we are looking into, uh, into locals who have become or are bound to become terrorists because the process of radicalization in some groups of society. So the definition of terrorism, cause of terrorism, radicalization are uh, uh, three uh, different aspects of the same, of the same uh, reality, which is how to be more effective in something which is unfortunately going to be with us for uh, some time to come, which is the scourge of terrorism. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you very much, Thank you very much Mr. Ambassador, for your uh, in insights. Uh, now I'm going to uh, try to develop some, some discussion, and um, I, I would appreciate very kindly if uh, you mention your name and uh, affiliation. Please, would you like to, um, um, can, you, can you get him the right? Thank you very much. My name is uh, Ni Akwete. I am with a group called ADNA. I study U.S. foreign policy towards Africa. I've done it for, this is my fourth decade, um, all from Washington. Um, Professor Alexander, actually, um, you had this uh, chart of the um, how terrorism in the Sahel has grown. I was wondering if later your office can share it. I think it would be good for some of our analysis. But my question goes to Ambassador Al-Sharif. I was wondering, you know, yesterday we heard that um, the Brotherhood in Egypt has been banned and their assets confiscated. Basically, they've been pu pushed underground. Would you care to speculate what impact that will have on terrorism in the Sahel? Thank you. Anyway, I, I think you can hear me. Before I go to uh, answering your question, I just I will refer, uh, I will hear, uh, uh, point to the ambassador of Spain, what he said uh, about the, I mean, he talked also about terrorism, but he we didn't tell us what is terrorism, because if you ask someone who is fighting for his freedom, for, uh, I mean, his house is demolished upon his head, uh, his uh, parents were killed, he goes and he fights those who did this, can you call him? Uh, uh, he called himself a, he's resisting, it's a resistance, but it's not, he's not a terrorist, therefore we cannot mix terrorism, like aggression, but it has no definition, and aggression is committed everywhere, so we have to define Mr. Ambassador, although it's difficult maybe, you talked about terrorism, but you couldn't define it, you cannot by any means, and this is I had the problem in defining it, and the United Nations could not find an agreement can, on, on this definition, it's a problem. Everyone is mixing resistance with terrorism. They are using even terrorism now to fight uh, corrupt regimes. Syria, he's saying now, the Assad himself, we are fighting terrorism. Is he? He's not. He's fighting his population. 100,000 died. Are those all are terrorists? So it's really, please, I think the problem is with definition still, although we don't admit it, or the West don't want to admit it. Anyway, I will ask, uh, you know, there is an ambassador here for Egypt. He can answer you, really. So don't put me in that position. <laughs> so I represent, to, to, I represent, I mean, the League as an intergovernmental organization, which does not represent the people. So I, uh, I mean, I don't know really what to tell you. You are <laughs> Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>
<laughs> yeah, we would have uh, we would have the ambassador from uh, Egypt to speak here. Uh, again, um, Mike Kraft, uh, from former State Department official. Can you get him the mic, please? Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I have uh, a general question for both ambassadors and a specific one for Ambassador uh, Sharif. Um, on the theme of international cooperation, though, that's been a mantra and a theme of certainly American policy since I joined the State Department Counterterrorism Office during the Reagan administration. And there's been a great deal of international cooperation going on, uh, both information sharing and specific uh, programs like training, countering terrorism violence is a, is a new one. Um, in the training, there's a great deal going on in the, in the uh, area of, of uh, both civilian officials and, and also on the military side. France has been involved, Germany, uh, UK, Australia. So it's not only an American effort. Um, but there's, and there's been millions of dollars spent on these various programs. What I'm curious is from the perspective of the developing country, countries, why do you think it's been so difficult to implement some of these practical programs and training? Is it uh, the education levels, lack of will in some of these countries, some suggestion of, of corruption going on? Because um, it's been very pro, uh, perplexing. For the future, uh, the ambassador from Spain mentioned counterterrorism violence in Saudi Arabia. It's, has started a program on that and others. And that may be one of the future to try to counter de-radicalization. Then my more specific question uh, for you, Mr. Ambassador, there have been a lot of claims that reports that uh, donors from Saudi Arabia and other Gulf countries have been funding some of the Al-Qaeda-related uh, terrorists in, Saudi, in uh, Syria. And this has become a big problem in terms of the balance, and it looks like the, some of the groups are becoming more radicalized, and but apparently a lot of weapons are going in. What is your your explanation for this attraction for funding these groups from people, especially in Saudi Arabia and, and uh, the Gulf countries, who would think would be kind of concerned about the Muslim Brotherhood or Al Qaeda type of jihadists? Thank you. Yeah, so I'd like to take uh, the answer. Yeah. Uh, Again, I don't want to speak for Saudi Arabia, but in general, there are many countries in the Arab world and where else where you, they, the government cannot control the people, individual people in, within the country itself for their contribution. This was really loose in many countries. You don't know where the money goes. It goes you give somebody who needs it, and then it goes to a third party. It's always the case. But in Saudi Arabia, they have really controlled now donation because we are our people there are very generous especially when it comes to month of ramadan the fasting month you can have people can collect money from anywhere this is be, of course before the 9 11 after the 9 11 saudi arabia i don't want to talk again there is an ambassador here but since you mentioned saudi arabia by name and i am a saudi i will let you know that we have now really a strict strict uh, uh, guidelines for any contribution to anyone of course, you have people who can leave the country and uh, contribute. We don't know about them. We don't observe everyone what, who, to whom he gives the money. But within the country itself, you don't have... I think no one is allowed to give money. The banks are also monitored. Everything now is monitored in coordination with the West and mainly the United States. The United States know that also. So we have now really uh, curtailed all these uh, contributions because we, uh, we give charity a lot of money. Saudi Arabia is one of the major countries, more than maybe another countries in contribution percentage to, uh, compared to the GDP or to the JNP, I mean. It's, uh, it goes to 4%, 5%, while other European countries, they are contributing uh, um, 0.7% or something. So it's, you, are, you are right, it's a problem, but we are con trying to control, to control it. it. You mentioned education, it's very interesting also. I think we should start with, when it comes to combating terrorism with education. It's a major issue. When, uh, I mean, when you teach, the, teach elementary children at an early age that uh, what is uh, terrorism, what uh, tolerance, accepting the others, respect of the others, 
this is very important, he will grow with it. But if you're going to teach him that they are going to kill you one day, the Muslims or the Christians or the Jews, of course they will grow up with that. But let us teach them at, a, at an early age what is tolerance, what is respect, and how to, to be, I mean, to, to accept others. This is a major uh, fact. Yes. Um, Ambassador Kaiser, you want to respond to that? Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor. I would like, uh, first of all, to, to make a comment about what, uh, the question of my friend uh, Nia Kuiti uh, concerning the brotherhood in, uh, in Egypt. And uh, I would like to remind you that uh, Egypt under uh, former President Morsi uh, played a very negative role in encouraging uh, terrorist actions in uh, the Sahel region. Uh, as you remember, uh, uh, Morsi uh, recognized uh, the uh, MNLA, the movement for uh, the liberation of the northern part of Mali, and Morsi also uh, was appealing and supported uh, the creation of, uh, the, of a new state for uh, uh, Tuaregs and other rebels in uh, northern uh, Mali. N remember also that one of the uh, leaders of uh, Muslim Brotherhoods uh, in Egypt, just after the uh, Boston uh, attacks, made the uh, declaration to say that uh, Boston terrorist attacks uh, were linked to uh, the French uh, military operation in the northern part uh, of Mali. So God, God be blessed that uh, Morsi doesn't exist anymore. And this uh, demonstrates the links uh, between, uh, but because don't, don't make any mistakes uh, between brotherhoods and Al Qaeda. Uh, all these Al Qaeda uh, affiliates, uh, they came from the brotherhoods. So, uh, Brother Ruth, uh, it's an extremely dangerous uh, uh, movement, uh, especially uh, with their uh, links uh, with the global international brotherhood uh, movement. Uh, the second uh, point I would like to uh, mention here, it's uh, about this question uh, concerning uh, what uh, uh, said why uh, we, uh, it's difficult to implement solutions uh, actually about terrorism. I think you, you are meaning terrorism. I think it's this uh, dealing with uh, terrorism uh, international today, it's an extremely complex uh, question. And uh, to deal with it, uh, we have to put in place uh, uh, an inclusive, a global uh, strategy uh, to, we can, uh, which involved many, uh, a lot of sectors. Not only uh, a military or security uh, solution can be found for uh, the uh, terrorism. And uh, 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 as you noted, maybe I was appreciating just now the adoption or the approval yesterday by the United Nations of the um, uh, integrated strategy. Uh, for security and development in uh, the Sahel. So we have not only the security, but also uh, other issues uh, to deal with it, uh, finally to find the solution of uh, extremism and, uh, and, and uh, integrism in the, in, uh, in the Sahel region and in Africa uh, at all. And I would lo like also here to, 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 to appreciate all what uh, the United States uh, did uh, last year, uh, 2012, uh, in supporting the research of a solution for uh, the uh, crisis in Mali, not only the crisis in Mali, but in dealing with the terrorist uh, operations in the north and uh, the activism of some uh, affiliates of, uh, of Al-Qaeda. Actually, uh, the uh, American administration uh, is uh, going forward uh, uh, some measures are taken to resume uh, all um, uh, development and bilater uh, military bilateral cooper uh, military cooperation with uh, Mali. Uh, the United States.
Associates uh, was uh, very well involved in the training of all uh, of uh, military from uh, all the neighboring countries uh, of Mali, especially uh, in the Sahel uh, region, and it was uh, the first supporter uh, for the adoption of uh, the UN resolutions in the Malian uh, crisis and uh, to find a definitive solution for uh, terrorism and activism in the northern part of Mali. So we are appreciating uh, the role of uh, the United States and actually uh, we are pushing with the American administration to go forward for the, uh, for the real implementation of uh, the uh, integrated strategy of uh, the UN. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Frieder, did you raise your hand? Did you raise your hand? I, I let others speak first. Okay. Okay, go ahead. Next. Yeah. Please, uh, yeah, go ahead. Your name and affiliation. Lawrence Freeman. I'm the uh, director of the Africa desk at EIR magazine. I've been involved in Africa for about 25 years. And, uh, I mean, first of all, I have been touched by the terrorism in Africa, a good friend of mine, an old friend of mine was killed in this attack in Westgate, the uh, poet of Ghana, Kofi Aluna, also a superior ambassador who was at the United Nations, was killed in the attack. I think the question they raised, which I, uh, I would like to ask again, is this question uh, that Saudi Arabia uh, has funded many of these Wahhabi movements, including the initial movement in Somalia, and there's now an investigation being pursued in the Congress of the United States to release the 28 classified pages from the 203 911 uh, Commission report that point to uh, the work of bon, uh, former Ambassador uh, Bandar and other Saudis. And there's now a discussion in the U.S. Congress to release these papers to declassify them, which were classified under George Bush. And the question of the, the Sahel, I don't, the, the terrorists themselves come from a different ideology. But the recruitment of these young men, and I've been in Mali, Sudan, all over Nigeria, these young men are recruitable because of the economic conditions. And as long as we don't have a development program for energy, water, for agriculture, transportation, the whole Sahel, is up for grabs for these people to move in and recruit. And I'd like people to address that question because counterterrorism by itself will not succeed without this massive development program. Thank you. And if you like to... As, again, I don't want to talk about what... Uh, I mean, the United States knows these documents you said about. They know if they are there, if they are not there. They should be the one to take it or to prove it or not to prove it. I will not get into that, but it's up to the United States. You know, our relationship is very uh, close. We are coordinating our uh, positions, especially when it comes to terrorism. And the United States is very satisfied, actually, with the role that Saudi Arabia played in this field. So, and why should, I mean, the Saudi Arabia suffered before the 9-11 from terrorism. And why should any country support terrorism? Of course, we, I told you, we are very generous people. We give money. It was not maybe monitored. Now it is mon we, are, we are monitoring every penny, really, that goes out of Saudi Arabia. And we have done so, and the United States is aware of, aware of these guidelines. But it was loose, the situation before, not only with Saudi Arabia. The United States was, had a good relationship with Osama bin Laden. And maybe he was trained here also. So, well, I mean, things change. Things change, the uh, countries make mistakes, people make mistakes, but we are trying now to cooperate. To have, I mean, Saudi Arabia is one that, it was the first country that requested or called for definition of terrorism first and establishment of a center of dialogue against, or uh, of combating terrorism, center for combating terrorism. And it will be financing that center also. We are trying to do our best, but this doesn't mean that uh, I mean, you, now, you, at this stage, you blame this or that. Because, but we are very sincere in combating terrorism. We suffered before 9-11. I don't want to repeat again and again. We suffered from terrorism. And we are trying to rehabilitate those who are deviants and to bring them to the fold of society. They are coming back. 
and really there are only few people who are really deviated and went back to terrorism, but the United States is learning, and those is learning from Saudi Arabia how to combat terrorism. Thank you. Uh, Ambassador Kreiter, any? Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor. Um, I think that once uh, already said that uh, the causes of uh, terrorism, it's not only the poverty or the economic situation uh, which motivate this, uh, uh, which motivate terrorism, uh, terrorism actions. Uh, uh, otherwise, how uh, you could understand that more than uh, 65 Somalis, Americans are already listed as uh, members of El Shabaab. How you could understand that most of them, uh, after being in the United States, in Minnesota or other uh, states, they leave everything and they go to join El, uh, El Shabaab. So there is other reasons here or other causes and that's why I'm supporting what uh, Minister Councilor of Morocco uh, has said and we are very well appreciating uh, the role of uh, His Majesty uh, Mohammed VI in uh, concluding this uh, uh, agreement about preachers in Mali. So there is a problem of uh, an ideological problem, a uh, problem of message which preachers uh, are uh, vehiculating uh, everywhere. And the, the case of Egypt is very clear. The last decision of the gov Egyptian government to prohibit all uh, these non-authorized imams or preachers in uh, the mosques, it's a very logic uh, decision. So it's not only poverty or uh, economic situation, it's an ideological problem and more and more we are talking about this uh, hybrid uh, ideology uh, for, uh, uh, for terrorist, uh, terrorist groups, um, especially the uh, Muslim uh, Brotherhoods. Uh, I stop here. Thanks. Well, I appreciate it very much. Uh, unfortunately, the clock is uh, ticking and uh, I uh, have to end, but I can promise you that uh, the discussion on terrorism uh, will continue. As we say, the academics, it's not the end of scholarship, the beginning, but unfortunately uh, we would have to deal with this for the next uh, century at least. I, uh, I would like to um, ask uh, my colleague, uh, <coughs> Professor Don Wallace, to make some closing remarks, but before he does, I want to stress that the work we're doing um, is uh, actually based on um, unclassified uh, materials interdisciplinary and international. Uh, we also have uh, international cooperation academically to deal with this and um, uh, Professor Dan Bottas will tell you ab about the International Law Institute. I'd like to mention that um, one of the organizations that we're working with is the Center for National Security Law of the University of Virginia School of Law. And uh, if you look at the information we try to provide, uh, you'll find information about an excellent book on the legal responses to terrorism that uh, the Center published. So again, I'm going to call my colleague and friend Professor Don Wallace, to make final remarks. You can come up here, if you don't mind. I'll stay here because okay. it, it's very late, and I'm not going to say much. Okay. The question was, what is the next phase in com cooperation in combating terrorism? And I hope that that phase will end with our winning the battle. Uh, one thing is I listened to this extremely informed group. Um, as the nature of cooperation among the terrorists changes, I imagine that the difficulty in cooperating to deal with them also grows. And in one of our panels uh, some weeks ago, we talked about intelligence, the NSA, etc. Um, various of our allies have not liked it, the Brazilians and others, but I think one thing which is crucial will be this continued cooperation in intelligence, which raises all kinds of questions. But we really don't have the time to 
to delve into the question of what is terrorism, what are its causes, how do you de-radicalize people, how do you rehabilitate people, all of which are issues. But it's going to be a long-term struggle, but I hope it won't last forever, Yona, and I hope someday the Potomac Institute can go into other work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will go there afternoon. Bye. Thank you.